Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on algorithms for coded random access and inference in large dimensional spaces. I'm Jean-Francois Chamberlain from Texas A&M University, and this tutorial will be given in conjunction with my colleague, Krishna Nanyanan. Initially, when we were asked to give a tutorial at SPCOM, we were thrilled to visit India and give this tutorial in front of a live audience. But due to current circumstances, we deliver this tutorial virtually. We'd like also to say that our hearts and thoughts are with the healthcare workers, the people and the family affected by the pandemic. We thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to interact with you, and we look forward to going through the tutorial together. On this note, let's get started. The first thing I would like to do is to take a second to thank Vemzi and Asset for their contribution to the results and to the tutorial. Vamzi is a student at Texas A&M University, and Asit is a postdoc at the same institution. And next, I would like to give a bit of a motivation for some of the problems we're interested in. The first bit of motivation comes from the fact that there are now more wireless connections in the world than there are humans on Earth. This is not to say that every human has a wireless connection because some people have more than one phone, but in any case, that shows a trend where market penetration has essentially saturated. The second piece of information comes in the physiology of the eye. So if we think of the eye acuity and its most accurate position, a zero degree where the fovea is, a 2020 vision corresponds to a degree accuracy of 0.0167. So that is the very best that your eye can do if you have a perfect vision. There's a sharp drop on the edges, especially once you're past 20 degrees. And if you're getting a little bit older like me, then your flexibility of the eye is not that good and your eye accuracy drops. This is pertinent because for years, the screen quality on mobile devices has driven data increase. But now we're at the limit where screens are so good that essentially, even if you improve the resolution in the screen, most people will not be able to see the difference. At the current screen resolution, someone with 2020 vision has to hold their device 1.876 inches away from their eye to be able to start seeing the resolution. Anything beyond that, and they lose the ability to distinguish between pixels. A third driver of data requirement for wireless devices has to do with mobile videos. As people started to watch more and more videos, then their need for bandwidth increased. But at this point, 63% of the US traffic is on smartphone and tablets. More than 70% of that is YouTube viewing. And 65% of all digital media time is spent on mobile devices. So you can hardly ask people to watch more movies. So if you're projecting a data increase for wireless devices, you have to be able to identify how it's going to increase. You can ask people to spend more time on their devices, but in the US, a person typically spend already three hours and 45 minutes on a device per day. Another option is to wait for the eye to evolve, but this is likely going to take a bit of time. And another option is to diversify your user population. So when you think about the future wireless landscape, you have to take into consideration that growth and market penetration are near saturation. The number of devices is larger than the population. Almost every human who wants a phone has one. Screen quality is reaching the capacity of the eye in terms of acuity. The viewing distance is already very, very close to the eyes and it's enabling virtual reality with phones. And people are spending already four hours per day on content rich application. A legitimate question then is what's next? A likely answer is the rise of the machine. Okay, maybe not this type of machine, but rather the Internet of Things type machine. 
So we envision a future where a myriad of sensors that are wirelessly enabled will be deployed. If this is the future, then we have to ask what type of traffic will these devices generate? And in particular, is this likely to be different than the traffic we're seeing today? So let's compare some of the characteristics between humans and machine. A YouTube video earns one view when it's watched for more than 30 seconds. Users on the internet expect web pages to load in less than two seconds, although this is going down. And the quality of a voice call will be deemed inadequate if the delay is greater than 250 milliseconds. Machines, on the other hand, they work on a different time scale. An operating system time size is about 10 milliseconds. The transmission time for LTE is on the order of 1 millisecond. And a microcontroller interrupt has a latency of 10 microseconds. So this is quite a contrast with a human connection. The other interesting aspect is the character of the payload of a message from a device. And for this argument, I polished off some old work from my PhD thesis that says that for the purpose of inference, most of the information is contained in the first few bits of a payload. This seems to be true for both detection and estimation problems, and it may be true in some control problems as well. A more credible source is the celebrated delta sigma type modulation, which also relies on the transmission of just a few bits per payload. In any case, it seems that there is an order magnitude difference between what device-to-device -device communication requires and what humans typically desire for their content-rich applications. Having said that, I realize that some of the applications that are coming, like video surveillance, are also content-rich. But the thesis is that if the content that a machine produces or desire is similar to what humans want, then we already know how to handle that type of traffic well. Whereas, if they only want a small payload with very low delay, this is fairly new. The challenge with the later type of traffic, small payloads and short delay, is that it invalidates the acquisition, estimation, and scheduling paradigm that has been so successful up to now in wireless system. And the reason why it invalidates this paradigm is that it shifts the balance between the cost and the reward of this scheme. If you have a few devices who want sustained connections, then it's well worth acquiring the channel and assessing the content of their queues. Based on that, you can schedule using the algorithms that you prefer. On the other hand, if you have a factor of a thousand more devices and they each want to send a very small payload, then if you invest the same amount of resources per device and your return on investment in terms of a packet transmission is small, the balance is completely off. This reality warrants a new thinking of wireless system tailored to machine-to-machine -to -machine communication. This evolving digital landscape has led to the revival of uncoordinated access. The new reality must account for the following. It must address the sporadic nature of machine-driven communications. It also has to take into consideration the small payload of the packets. It precludes the use of opportunistic scheduling because of the overhead. And altogether, it forms a significant departure from the past successes in wireless systems. A final point that comes into consideration in this tutorial is related to communication and identity. When the number of devices that are wirelessly enabled within a certain area is vast, with only a few of them being active at any point in time and for a short period, the challenge of identifying the devices and allocating resources has to be taken into consideration. It cannot simply be swept under the rug as being amortized over long connections since the connections are very small. Altogether, 
This leads to the rising interest in uncoordinated and unsourced schemes. And Krishna will give us some background on this particular view of wireless communications.